I do have a message and I believe that I'm going to be on this track for most of the year. I don't know if you saw that thing, I don't know who started it on Facebook, it came from somewhere. But it said Groundhog's Day, you know, it was last week, the second. It says if you see the pastor's shadow on February 2, he'll be on the same series for the next six weeks. So last week I talked about the gospel with power. Guess what I'm talking about this morning? The gospel with power, part two. Continued. It's continued for 2,000 years. So I read this morning... Mark chapter 16, and uh, I'm going to look. To, I'm going to skip down from 15 to 17. These signs shall accompany, shall follow those who believe in my name, in the name of Jesus. So don't get it in some denominational name or some high-powered preacher's name, but in the name of Jesus, drive out demons, speak in new tongues. Pick up snakes. There's a snake handler cult, Christian group. It's called Tempting God, you know. There's a story of this guy that accidentally ended up in one of those churches. And after church, they got around a circle, and they were they were passing this snake around. And when they, when they got to him, he, he didn't know what to do, so he said, Eholabakai, the Lord says, pass me by. Tongues... <laughs> Tongues and interpretation. The Bible confirms, book of Acts, where Paul was bitten by a snake that came out of the firewood and then nothing happened. We had a lady in our church years ago in the Philippines there. She climbed up to get a piece of fruit and guava out of a tree, got bit by one of the most poisonous snakes in the Philippines. The clinic was right next door and they said, you better pray because you got about 20 minutes because her body just started turning numb. She said, I already know Jesus. And uh, then, then that feeling went out of her and she was fine. Everybody was watching her, the nurse and the doctor figured she was dying in 20 minutes. So these things are real. The only one that um, I, I don't remember if it's confirmed anywhere in the Bible is the part about eat any deadly thing, although we're challenged with that every meal around here. <laughs> but this is why we say grace. Seriously, I, when I first went to the Philippines, first few times, every time I'd, I'd get diarrhea, you know? And it's hard to be traveling and preaching and all that when you're running to the toilet all the time. And so I started claiming these verses and I was fine from there out. Come on, it's real. We say grace. Some people think you're too religious if you pray for the meals. I think it's wonderful. It's not about being religious. Well, you don't need to pray. Listen, don't freak out if you forget. I still forget once in a while. About halfway through a hamburger, I got right in the drive-thru and I go, oh, oh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> you know, it's not about being perfect about it. It's the re remembering who provided it, right? And giving thanks to him. And then often we might pray uh, and thank you for the hands that prepared it. Because somebody did some, some work to fix that food, right? It's also about God's cleansing power. It really is. It goes back to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 4. It says, everything is to be received that we eat with thanksgiving. And it's cleansed by the word of God and prayer. So when we were first walking with God, we were part of a group somewhat similar to Gethsemane. And uh, our, our, our leader, he was like 28, way older than most of us. Been saved a whole year. He would preach and pray until the food was cold every meal. Just to make sure that it came, <laughs> whatever come out of that kitchen was going to be sanctified. So it's good to remember who, gov who, who, who gives you... Your, your meals and your food and your ability to get wealth, the Bible says, right? God has power over creation. 
including the food. The God of the natural and the God of the supernatural. Miracles, signs, and wonders. Jesus Christ did it. He did it. Calmed the winds, walked on water, cast devils out, healed people. Miracles, signs, and wonders. We read last week in the book of John 14, 12. You're going to do greater things than these, just like I did. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he's given that power. According to Mark 16 and other passages, he's given that power to us. Every one of us in this room. See, Jesus' style, his, his M.O., Matthew 4, 23 and 24, he went around teaching, preaching the good news, and healing the sick. Teaching, preaching, healing. Teaching, preaching, healing. Went around. Amplified says, the weak and the tormented. He touched the weak and the tormented. People that had demonic issues. Lunatics. Paralyzed people. A lot of times we see somebody with a problem, we're like, oh, God, I hope you're not telling me to do something. <laughs> I'll light a candle on Sunday. Bible says in Acts 10, 38, Jesus of Nazareth went around doing good. He went around doing good and healing all that were oppressed the devil, for God was with him. God is Emmanuel to you and me. God is with us. We're, we're made in the image of God, and, and as we're born again, we have the image of Christ living in us, right? Doing good, he roamed around. You notice that in, in that one song, it talked about how that person had panic attacks. For 19 years, they had panic attacks, but when they got to church in one particular time, and they got healed. Praise God, he can touch any of that kind of stuff. There's this old Canadian preacher I traveled with. He had a deadly disease in his 20s. He said he wasn't given any hope. He said, I had prayer about a hundred times at various church meetings and situations and friends praying for me about a hundred times. He says, I don't know what happened, but he says, I got healed. Now that man, I haven't heard from him lately, but he, last time I heard from him, he was 89. Supposed to die in his 20s. See, with God, nothing is impossible. You can get healed in the meeting like that lady did of her panty tax. I assume that was a lady that wrote that song. Might have been a guy. A guy wished me happy birthday on, on, a, on a video, and uh, he had panty tax back in the, around 2000 or something. He'd been a preacher and a pastor for 25 years. Just started having these panic attacks. I can tell you other stories about that, you know. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, panic attacks. It can be for various chemical reasons, but listen, the enemy wants to mess with us. And it's, and it's a spirit of fear, some kind of trauma going on. And I can't give you all the answers, but I've seen people healed by the power of Jesus' name. Come on, all things are possible with God. That's right, Jesus taught, it says he had a habit in Luke 4 of going to the synagogues. He traveled around from different villages to the synagogue. But I've heard for a long time, the, the last place in the world you're going to get healed is in a church that doesn't believe it. Amen. No, that's not true, man. Jesus went to these synagogues. There was nobody got healed in those synagogues ever, and they didn't believe in all that stuff. It was Old Testament stuff. And he walks in, and the guy with an old shriveled arm, <laughs> Come on, God can heal people anywhere he wants. He can do miracles anywhere he wants. So Jesus was in the synagogues, which is kind of similar to, to a church structure. That's kind of where we got it. And some people say, oh, you know, someday the church will never look the same. It'll be more glorious and this and that. Well, how are you going to get away from prayer? Jesus said it was a house of prayer. Singing and the word of God. It's going to come in some shape. You know what I'm saying? Don't get away from that because you're some contemporary weird version of what you think a church is. I want to look at Acts chapter 3. Example of a number of things. One, it's doing the same thing Jesus did. Greater works. Peter and John were going up to the temple. 
at the hour of prayer, three in the afternoon. Now, first of all, as far as I know, there hadn't been much done in that temple for a long time. It's not about belief. It was about ceremony. It's about the corruption of the priests. Jesus made a mess there th two times in his three years of ministry because it was so corrupt. He went in there and dumped everything over and chased people out of there. There were no miracles going on there. These guys, even though they were saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, had the commission to go forth, they kept going to a dry place and praying. Listen, wherever you go in life, you may end up in one of them places. Don't just, don't just badmouth it about how dry and dead everybody's in there. Bring some life and power in there. You know, life and power, light and power into that place. Who knows, God might use you to encourage somebody, to pray with somebody. We picked up some chairs at the Baptist Church in Lacey, Lacey Bible Church. It's called Youth Pastor. We've been there about a year. When we got in a circle, we prayed for him and the church and everything. And then we asked him to pray. Man, he was praying for healing for, for uh, Sean. Praise the Lord. Baptists believe in healing. At least that one does. But Jesus went around. He went around doing good things and healing all that were oppressed the devil. For God was with him. Because some people believe God only heals in church. And then you got some that go, no, he only does powerful stuff outside the church. Listen, he's not limited by a church. Sometimes things happen in the church that don't happen on the outside. Because you got a gang of people and their corporate faith together is powerful. But you, God can use you whether you, you, you have anybody with you or not. Because faith is focused on God, not on you. That's the problem we have. Well, I don't have so much faith. No, it's not. Faith is not about you. It's about an almighty God. So here we are in Acts chapter 2. And it suddenly occurred to me, Jesus walked through this door, this gate, many times since he was 12 years old and didn't heal this guy. And I was thinking, now he came there when he was 12. I wonder if it went through his mind. God, I'm going to heal this guy, but in your schedule, 12 years old. And when he was 30 something, he walked through there several times going, it's coming. Jesus is thinking, it's coming, it's coming. This guy is 40 years old. Now Peter and John went as it was their habit in the hour of prayer to the temple, they'd walk by this guy many times. So you'd like to believe that God would, you go to the hospital, everybody in there would get healed. Or every sick person you ever knew would get healed, or this and that. Well, God has a schedule and timing. He always knows the bigger picture. Whether it's for your personal healing, your personal deliverance, your personal uh, situations you have like panic attacks or whatever it is, God has his timing. It's not a matter of him making you sick or causing you grief. It's a matter of his schedule for when those things will be relieved. Relieved. The Bible says in uh, Acts 40, 22, that this guy was came there every day and flew his sign. Forty years he's sitting there begging. The man was lame from birth and was being carried to the temple gates called Beautiful where he was put every day to beg from those who were going into the temple. And he had a problem, a real problem. Can't fault him for that, but I mean, after 40 years, probably getting discouraging. And he saw Peter and John coming there and he asked them for money. That's what this translation says. Some of them say he looked up expecting to receive something, something from them. Now I've heard people make a big deal about the guy's expectation, but listen, he was expecting to get some money, not healed. He was expecting it probably because Peter and John were the kind of generous people that pitched something in the bowl. That's why he was expecting something. He saw these guys, maybe they talked to him in the past, I don't know, but he was expecting that they were gonna, gonna give him something. <laughs> Verse four, Peter looked straight at him and John did too and, the, and the Peter said, look at us. So he paid attention because there's probably other people going through there. Silver and gold, silver and gold have I none. How's God ever going to use me with an empty pocket? 
Sometimes he can use you better with an empty pocket. Because you're not dependent on it. He had no money that day. But here's what I do have. I have a resonant power within me. And it's God's schedule for you to have your life transformed. Here's what I give you. Here's what I got. Here's what's in me. Here's what the Holy Spirit is saying. Now's the time. Walked in there many times. Man, it'd be cool if that guy got healed. And then there's something that happens. Somebody, the story the other day about this guy who was American who went to New Zealand. Did you hear that story? He went to New Zealand and because he, he was preaching there and they went to a restaurant. This waitress came and served them and stuff and then he just kept feeling this impression. He wanted to talk to her, but the one that finished up was somebody else. So he said he went out to the car and he just could not leave without going back in there. Said, hey, what happened to that lady that waited on us? Oh, she's in the back on her break. Can you ask her to come out? Said, you know, I just can't uh, help but want to talk to you and invite you to church. Now that's pretty simple. No big whammy miracle. But he could not get over it because the Holy Spirit was just after him. Anybody ever have that happen? To say something or do something and you just can't shake it. You know, you got your excuses. You run through in your mind. I haven't got time. Uh, whatever it is. Don't know if it's God. You just can't shake it, you know. And she started weeping. She's American. She, she said, my husband and I moved to New Zealand. We've never really gone to church. Don't even know if there is a God. I said, God, if you're real. She said, I talked to God this morning. I said, if you're real, have somebody invite us to church. That's, that's a word of knowledge or whatever you want to call it. That's God's Holy Spirit using you in a powerful way. So this guy went walking and leaping and praising God. I like the King James version of that. Walking and leaping and praising God. Then, of course, after everybody saw, they knew who it was. They started, you know, claiming Peter and John were some powerful angelic being or something. And uh, they said, look, <laughs> don't look at us. It's by faith in Christ that made this man strong. If God ever uses you in signs, wonders, and miracles, uh, some sort of way that you understand that it was supernatural, it wasn't just a coincidence, fine appointments, you ever heard that term? I mean, there's some days you just, like, it's just, how, Lord? <laughs> you run across somebody you haven't known, <laughs> you haven't seen, excuse me, forever. Or someone you just wanted to talk to and you didn't know where they lived or whatever, and all of a sudden, wham! That's God setting it up. A divine appointment. The power to see a stunning display of power. With or without a bank account. Or a car. Or anything that you think is absolutely necessary to get ministry done. Power Evangelism is a book that was written by a guy named John Wimber. Who was instrumental in starting the Vineyard Church. Power Evangelism. Now, not everybody that gets touched by some supernatural way is going to get saved, but often it opens their heart for the gospel. And you start to share with them, it was, it's because of Jesus, and then you give them a brief gospel in that. Power evangelism. I was thinking about this uh, little short guy we knew in the Philippines, old pastor there, and our friend Roger Balsley. Uh, went to this church on a Sunday morning in the southern Philippines and it was a church that didn't believe in, in the power of God to heal but they had this weird thing that if you put this piece of black coral between your fingers and touch people they would see a miracle <laughs> like what? So Roger, as he got done preaching, you know, he kind of pulled this pastor aside because he could see the guy was like listening to him, you know, this assistant pastor. And, and, and he says, hey, you want to talk some more? What you really need is to get baptized in the Holy Spirit. So the guy came to our hotel room and uh, we laid hands on him. He went down on the bed and was there for 30 minutes speaking in tongues. 
Then he got up and went and planted a church. And uh, it grew to about 150. And then he had some guy come and help him who stole the whole church. You know what? He didn't stop. When things go wrong, and you go, oh my God, my God, just keep going, just keep going. So I get this call, there was his family. <coughs> I said, can you pray for our mom because she's dying? So he goes to their house, prayed for her. She got raised up, completely healthy, and the whole family gave their life to Christ. Amen. And they started a new church. They hang a little sign outside the house. And it went on from there. A new church started because of God's power to raise somebody from their deathbed. Power evangelism. I could lead people to Christ in the, in the first five minutes. Anybody he met knew. He had a way. Instead so of just getting in their face, he go, hi, I'm uh, His name was Tayoto, his last name was like, hi, I'm Pastor Tayoto, how are you, this and that, and other thing. Say, what do you think about Jesus? Have you ever thought about Jesus? Here, you know what he did? He, oh, he was raised from the dead. He just had this little gentle way of giving them the whole gospel, and he led people to Christ all the time. It doesn't take a miracle, but it doesn't hurt anything either. We'll look back at uh, uh, John 14 again. Because we don't want to just go with the one verse. We want to go with the next verse too. See, I tell you, whatever, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater works than these because I'm going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Now that's not carte blanche because sometimes, you know what that means? That means it ain't gonna work every single time because you ask for stupid things. <laughs> You're asking for things that are not of God. They're not lining up with the will of God. But also there's the timing of God. Could be God's will, but it's just off timing. Oh, he's not listening. No, you gotta have faith in those periods when God sustains you and keeps you going because it takes faith to keep on going, to have the courage to keep going until you see the answers that God has for you, right? So doing the greater works has to do with prayer, right? Well, I don't know how to pray. Listen, God doesn't care about the fancy stuff. He just wants you to talk to him. Book of Exodus, when they were under tremendous bondage of slavery by the Egyptians, the Bible said their cry came up to God. They weren't very devout. They'd been there for a long time. Maybe 400 years. It wasn't a devout bunch. They were more racially Hebrews than they were devout Hebrews. But their cry came up to God and he heard them. Amen? Just pray like you're talking to the almighty, wonderful God. One time they asked Jesus, this is John chapter 6, he said, what can we do to work the works of God? They were probably thinking they could take a seminar. Yeah. Go to a retreat, yeah. Read a book. Get a magic formula so people would be wowed every time I pray and the sparks would fly. What's the formula? You know what he said? Because, listen, we all kind of think, well, I must be missing something because I don't see that many miracles and signs and wonders in my life. Oh, well, the thing is, part, part of it is that thing, you're looking for big ones. Little ones are happening all the time. But he says here in uh, John 6, <coughs> 26, cruising through there. And verse 20, excuse me, yeah, 28. What must we do to work the works of God requires? And, they, and Jesus said, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he sent. No magic formula, just believe. Prayer is not wishful thinking. Prayer is not a religious activity. Prayer, prayer is not just a way to get free stuff. 
First of all, relationship and power. Relationship and power. Prayer changes and rearranges. Every time you got an attitude, one of those kind of attitudes, and you pray and it goes away, guess what? That's a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> he changes and rearranges the human heart. He changes things man cannot change. I've been meditating on something that I said last week that's been bugging me because I do it all the time. Before I was a Christian, I was trying to f figure out how to fix stuff, you know? Then after I became a Christian, I took it to God in prayer and then tried to figure out how to fix stuff. <laughs> you fuss when you're not a Christian and then you get saved and then you pray and then you fuss. How's God going to pull this off? I can't figure this out. Pray and put it in His hands. Put it at His throne. Put it in His lap. You know, often we're just too impatient. We can't wait for things to happen. I want it, and I want it now. It changes what man cannot change, which includes the human heart. You can learn a few psychological tricks from somebody, but it doesn't really change your heart. Just you know how to get out of hot water, but you can't change the fact that you're in it a lot. <laughs> We base faith not on our background, our experience, how we're raised, what church we went to, what Bible study we went to. Faith comes by hearing what? The Word of God so it can build us up. But faith is focused on God's power. I think I mentioned we, when we were first saved, we didn't know anything. We didn't know the Bible. I couldn't find Jesus in this book. And we were seeing miracles the first week that we were saved. Amen. We just asked, and it had happened. Oh, did you see that, Diane? God's so real. It was all about God. Then I got discipled and found out it was all about me. <laughs> well, man, how can I remember all this stuff? There's pages and pages of stuff. See, we always want an instant, I believe every time for an instant answer. Come on. I believe every single time for an instant answer. Why would you believe for something else? Yeah, God, do this please and do it next week. Not now, I'm tired. <laughs> I believe for an instant miracle. Now, I, I've seen miracles that happen the next day. I've seen Miracles happen a couple weeks later. I've seen miracles and answers to prayer, powerful answers to prayer that took a long time. When I got saved, because of the Vietnam War, I, I was that era, I wasn't in the military, but I prayed, to, I prayed to go to Vietnam and do something positive in Vietnam. It took 22 years before God sent me over there. And I've been over there like, I don't know, seven times or something. Teaching the Bible, helping people to get along over there. <laughs> Some good groups, spirit-filled groups are, you know, got a thing going against each other, helping to reconcile. Come on, we always want an instant answer, but sometimes we get delayed answer. And then we think it's a no answer when it's just a delayed answer. God always sees the bigger picture. Like the man at the gate, 40 years. Jesus walked by, disciples walked by. God said, now, now is the time. Amen. So what is our faith based on? Belief in Jesus. Is it based on your power? It's the power of God in you. Power of God focusing and going through you. Yeah. Sometimes when you feel the least likely, I'm just not into it right now, God just says, Dan, huh? okay, here we go. Here we go. I'm kind of tired right now. Ask Brian to do it. Here we go. Here we go. 
Come on, don't look at the neighbor. Well, I've never done that before. A lot of times God says, good, good. I've never led anybody to Christ. Good. You can do it now. You can do it now. Well, I've never prayed for a sick person. Do it now. Come on. You'd be surprised what God does when you put your pride down. Well, what if it doesn't happen? People ask you that all the time. What if it doesn't happen? How do you know it didn't happen? Just because you can't see anything. I'm serious. God's mighty God. Just because you don't see something with your own natural eyes doesn't mean the Holy Spirit, the angels, and everybody's just going like crazy doing stuff because you prayed. <coughs> These signs shall follow those who believe. How many are believers today? Come on. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, you deposited your amazing grace in us. Thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord. We thank you for experiences. We thank you for the Bible. But most of all, God, we just thank you that we are, we are your children. We are your temples. Lord, fill us up and pour us out to a dry world. A world that's in confusion, depression, living in darkness. Lord, may we be their light. And uh, light and salt are not real expressive. But God, they're powerful. Everyone in this room this morning, we just agree together that during this year, we're going to see people come to Christ. We're going to see lives change. We're going to see attitude change. We're going to see people with panic attacks set free. We're going to see bodies healed. We're going to see mighty things, God. We're believing you, Lord, for natural miracles, spiritual miracles, things that man cannot do, you do quite well. We just thank you for it this morning, Lord. We base our faith in heaven, and we thank you that you're touching earth with us. That if we... Uh, come to you, powerful things would happen. If two or three of us come to you together, powerful things are going to happen. Amen? Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, God bless you all.